What's going on, everybody, and welcome in to this edition of B Shape Daily. I understand it might look a little different. It might sound a little different. It's because it is a little different. As you can see behind me, the bustling metropolis of Nashville, Tennessee, is where we are bringing you this video from. It is Monday. Check the date, December 4th. And you might say, well, how'd you forget the date? It's a whirlwind when you're at the MLB Winter Meetings in Nashville held at the Opryland Resort and Convention Center, the Gaylord Opryland Resort and Convention Center. Such a long name for such a massive building, uh, the biggest building that I've ever been in. I'll try to not gesticulate too much so as not to shake the precarious positioning of my laptop here. But I did want to get on here, despite it being a little bit difficult to find the place and the time to do so, to talk some St. Louis Cardinals this week. I am down here in Nashville covering the winter meetings. Not a whole lot happening yet so far for the Cardinals, but we did get some good insights, I thought, from John Moselock on Monday evening. The way it works down here is the uh, the assembled media, number of St. Louis media members here get an opportunity in the evenings to check in into the suite where the St. Louis Cardinals front office, the Cardinal Brass, do their work this week. And John Moselock, gracious enough to answer some questions for us about what's going on here at the meetings from a Cardinal perspective. So we did get a chance to have that earlier this evening. And even before that took place, there was somewhat a, a newsworthy element to the proceedings as John Moselak went on MLB Network radio this morning and dropped Tyler O'Neill by name as a player the Cardinals are listening on when it comes to trade offers from other teams. Wrote a story for KMOV.com. Uh, check out all my work. Over there, my written work is uh, I continue to cover the Cardinals for them. But uh, I, I thought it was interesting that we heard John Moselak use Tyler O'Neill's name as a guy the Cardinals are looking to trade. It's not really a secret. It's not different than anything I've been telling you guys here on b Shape Daily or on the YouTube channel, uh, which if you enjoy this kind of Cardinals content, not a ton of people here from the St. Louis media. You got a few post-dispatch. Um, I got Jeff Jones from the Belleville News is here. Matt Pauley with KMOX is here. Saw Claves. Katie Wu, of course, is here. John Denton here from MLB.com. But, uh, you know, it's a, it's an intimate gathering. And so I don't know how many of those guys are making YouTube videos. Uh, they're probably smarter than that. Uh, I'm the only fool to have that sitting in here in my hotel room on YouTube. Maybe some of them are. I don't know. But uh, my point is, if you enjoy this kind of Cardinals content, make sure to hit subscribe on the channel, and uh, there'll be more of it to come. But specific to Tyler O'Neill, not surprising the notion that the Cardinals would be looking to trade him, but maybe a little bit unique that John Moselak would say so, right? Would say the quiet part out loud is kind of the way that I look at it. Look, we obviously know that last year did not go well for Tyler O'Neill, based on, I think, the expectations or the hopes, at least, that the Cardinals had for him coming into the year. Uh, it was a disappointment, right? They started the season giving him every opportunity to win the center field job and didn't really hit out of the gate, didn't look comfortable. I, I To me, just didn't look natural in center field as much as he had uh, during his seasons where he won a gold glove as a left fielder. Two gold gloves to his credit. He is an athletic player. I just didn't feel like the instinct for center field uh, was befitting Tyler O'Neill. It's not that he played there a ton, but it was the narrative surrounding him coming out of spring training that, hey, he's going to have this opportunity to be the everyday center fielder. And then within a week of the season beginning, you had Ali Marmel calling him out for his effort running the bases in a, in a home loss to the Braves. I think it was that first week of the season in April and things just, you know, kind of spiraled from there. O'Neill obviously missing almost half the year from early May to mid to late July with a back injury that I don't think the Cardinals initially thought would take two and a half months to get him through. And then you had that incident in Tampa down uh, at the Tropicana Field in August where I felt like Tyler O'Neill two days in a row, all he puts him in the lineup, two days in a row, he opts out of playing in the game. Talking about the knee, felt like he wasn't comfortable on the turf. Was it a knee injury? Was it just uh, concerned that it would become an injury? What was, you know, discomfort? What was going on there? It seemed to kind of take Ollie and the Cardinals by surprise a little bit, especially the second day. They thought, okay, well, he could be in after getting the day off. Did play the third game of that series. Maybe it wasn't that big of a deal, but it's still something that stuck in my mind as maybe what might have been like the straw that broke the Campbell's back for the Cardinals in terms of 
Like, what is this guy's everyday reliability, day-to-day, week-to-week, throughout a season? What can we count on him to do? I feel like the Cardinals at that point uh, maybe looked at O'Neill and said, you know, we've done everything that we can. We just haven't been able to rely upon this guy to fill out the role that we're hoping for him. Um, And then, I mean, he did do some good hitting toward the end of the season before he hit the IL with that foot injury in mid-September that cost him the rest of his season. Um, But the OPS only rose up to 715 overall. It was 620 when he went on the IL May 5th. So it went up over the latter stint of the season that he had uh, late July, August, and, and early September. But I think for the Cardinals, just maybe not enough reliability, consistency, Uh, being able to unlock and untap the potential that they knew he had. So I think disappointment from what they got from him in 2023. And as they look to their offense and their alignment for 2024, it seems like it's easy to trace through why O'Neill maybe wouldn't be a big part of that or a part of it at all. When you hear Moselock this morning on that same MLB radio hit, say, if we had to play a game today, we're looking at new bar and left which I've been saying they they don't view him as a primary center fielder. Their preference is for him to be in the corner, something that Ollie Marmel told us uh, on the final day of the season, where I kind of thought, okay, he has shifted now into the mode of next year, looking ahead, knows this year wasn't great, and said, yeah, we we think going forward he's, he's more of a corner guy if we had our druthers. Uh, I don't think Ollie actually said druthers. That was more of my inclusion. Center field, he said Tommy Edmund, Moselak did this morning and right field Jordan Walker, as we all know. So I thought that was kind of interesting, even more interesting to add Dylan Carlson. Again, this was unprompted. He wasn't asked, like, go over the roles for all these players specifically, but he said fourth outfielder is the way that we view Dylan Carlson kind of coming into the season. Trades, different things can obviously change that. But he names those four players, and then Tyler O'Neill doesn't get mentioned until he says, we're listening on Tyler O'Neill in terms of trade offers. So that was kind of the newsworthy element of the day from the Cardinals. We did get a chance to ask Mo about that when we got up to the suite at the Gaylord. I can't even say the whole Gaylord Opryland Resort and Convention Center. We got up to the suite. That was obviously one of the first questions that was asked, um, kind of to expand upon the thoughts with O'Neill. And Mosaic ultimately said if they, they feel that maybe it would be one of those things that would be the best for both sides if something is able to get done, because O'Neill still views himself as an everyday player. The Cardinals do as well, but aren't going to necessarily be able to find those at-bats in that role for him within the way that they're constructed. And I think a big part of that is because of center field. The fact that O'Neill just didn't really stick there, didn't fit there last year, and they view Nupar as maybe more of a corner outfielder as well. Obviously, Jordan Walker, if he's in your outfield mix rather than a primary DH, you're going to see Jordan Walker in right field. So that just doesn't leave a lot of opportunity for O'Neill unless you factor in the designated hitter which I think the Cardinals aren't as prone to do, knowing that Nolan Gorman is going to take up a chunk of that when Donovan plays second base, knowing that, and that was, by the way, the only or that Mo said when he was mapping out the lineup, Contreras behind the plate, Goldie at first, Donovan or Edmund at second. Pardon me. Pause. Time out. And I, it, here's the other thing about this. I can't pause this video because I do not have the editing capacity uh, with my internet connection to pause and edit this video so it's all going to be one take today that's why it's going to be a little rougher around the edges not recording with my microphone but you guys will hopefully be on board and and be over it and hopefully happy for the content but anyway it wasn't Edmund listed at second Donovan slash Gorman at second Mason win at short I think that's the ideal world for the Cardinals Nolan Arado at third and then the outfield as I mentioned it and then obviously flexibility to put Walker at DH on a given day to put Uh, Wilson Contreras at DH on a given day. He's going to be the primary catcher, but they will look to get some opportunities too uh, for Yvonne Herrera, who's going to be now the backup with Andrew Kisner DFA'd, uh, or not DFA'd, non-tender before that deadline in November. And there will be opportunities potentially too for, uh, you know, Gorman to play DH. I probably already said that. Donovan to uh, be the second baseman on those days. Donovan can fly out to left field. Maybe you get Newt Bar off his feed for a day in DH. They want to use that spot to be fluid with some of their regulars and get them opportunities. That's what they looked to do last year with uh, Arenado and Goldschmidt. It happened that way as well. So I think between those guys, Walker, Gorman, and Contreras specifically, you probably have your DH days mostly allotted to where I don't know that O'Neill is going to be getting a bunch of those at-bats either. 
And honestly, if O'Neill's going to be on your team and playing, it would be for the best that he would have a chance to do so in left field because defensively that's where he is at his best. But I don't think the Cardinals, knowing that you have maybe a bit of a range deficiency in right field with the lack of an uh, outfield experience for Jordan Walker, you probably look to have the best range you possibly can in center field. I think that's why Edmund was the guy named there by Mosellock. It does take a leap of faith to assume that Edmund will be the everyday center fielder. And the leap of faith that you're taking is that Mason Wynn can hit enough to justify his spot at shortstop for 130, 140 games per season. He didn't do that this past season when he got a cup of coffee at the end of September. The numbers weren't great for Mason Wynn offensively, but I also think that experience was good for him just to get that out of the way, know what it's like to face big league pitching, maybe struggle a little bit as he did, but know going into your offseason what you want to improve upon to take that next step. I think we all know that Mason Wynn is talented enough to take that next step. It's just a matter of him doing it and doing it at the big league level um, that the Cardinals are going to be relying upon if Edmund's going to be their everyday center fielder. Um, throwing into the, the mix as well, Richie Palacios, who I think did a, a lot to earn an opportunity coming into the season. But I look at that as more to make the roster, not to necessarily take a starting role or be the fourth outfielder role. I think Palacios could play a little center field for you if he needed to. He showed some good athleticism and range defensively. Good instinct, I thought, defensively last year for the Cardinals. I just don't think he's necessarily, as you're mapping out the ideal version of your team, I don't think he's any higher than maybe the last outfielder, that fifth guy in the outfield mix on your bench. I know Burleson kind of could fit into that realm as well, but not somebody who can play center field. So I can understand kind of the questions about, well, where does everybody fit in? I think that's why the Cardinals do need to make a trade, right? The best thing for everybody probably would be O'Neill on a different team. I think it's better for the Cardinals. I think it's better for O'Neill because the role that they wanted to put him into, I just don't think he thrived in it last year. And he could, again, I thought this was probably the most comedic moment from Mosellock's availability upstairs at the at the suite where he was asked, like, you know, trading a Rosarena, a Dallas Garcia, you see these guys go elsewhere and do great things. Does that add to your hesitancy maybe to, to do a deal now? And just how do you look at that? And Mo said, well, it doesn't add to him, you know, being able to pull the trigger on those deals. Um, I believe he said the quote he likes is, if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying. So I think the narrative is that Mosellock is gun shy on these trades. He doesn't see it that way. I think you could make a case that like time has shown him to maybe be that way a little bit. Like The Cardinals had every incentive to make one of these types of trades last offseason. Clear the deck. You've got all these outfielders. The pieces don't quite fit find a way to trade one of those outfielders, maybe two of them for some pitching or even for some prospects that aren't on the 40 man yet, just to kind of kick that can down the road, but open up the opportunity for the guys you do want to retain in the outfield to get to play a lot. And they couldn't make one of those trades. And now you're kind of a year later in an identical position, maybe even a worse spot because there are more outfielders in the group that you know can hit at the big league level. Like, Burleson was solid enough, not as good as I think the Cardinals wanted him to be, but offensively, like I think he's a big league hitter. Jordan Walker now is a year more matured and is, it has proven to be a big league hitter. You just have too many guys that are in that mix. So I feel like if the Cardinals weren't gun shy about trades, why aren't they able to make them? I guess would be my first question because other teams around baseball are making deals. Like the deal that, that kind of kicked off the winter meetings on Sunday was with the Braves acquiring Jared Kelenic from the Seattle Mariners in basically a Mariner salary dump. They trade Evan White to the Braves in that deal. Um, who else did they trade? Marco Gonzalez goes in that deal, and the Braves aren't even necessarily looking to keep him, but they're on the hook. It's like a hot potato. They're currently on the hook for the money that's owed to Marco Gonzalez this year, but I don't think they care. They got Jared Kelenic, who can be a really quality outfielder. He's still like 23, 24 years old, and basically the Braves, by taking on some salary, landed that player the guys that they gave up I just don't think were very regarded prospects Cole Phillips was one of them but he has I believe been injured and so hasn't really pitched but it's just one of those things where it's like all right if you're if you're the Braves is that a complicated trade sure like is that the type of trade that you you could just like see ABC and put together quickly probably not but they were willing to think about maybe a little bit outside the box I feel like if it's not being gun shy for the Cardinals, it's their inability to be willing or uh, relish the opportunity to make those 
creative kinds of trades. You just don't see Moselak really in his front office really make those types of trades too much, at least in recent years. Uh, but Mo, Mo did say tonight, it's not, you know, that they're, that he's gun shy uh, or, or that he allows those things to impact uh, what could come here. But he did say, as I get to the comedic part of it, when he was asked about, you know, just his impression of, yeah, you traded these guys away. They were great. And now, you know, you're potentially looking to do a similar thing this off season. What happens to that outfielder that you trade away? Mo said, yeah, he probably gets MVP votes this year <laughs> in all reality, um, which I think was a joke, but also you, can kind of see where his point is with uh, the track record there. But yeah, I think ultimately we learned from Mozeliak today by him actually saying the quiet part out loud that Tyler O'Neill is not going to be on this team in February. I don't know how. I think the reaction from some Cardinals fans is going to be, that's the relief pitcher that they got for Tyler O'Neill. Like they, they sold low, but you got to remember he's owed five, $6 million this season, regardless of who's paying it by tendering him a contract and not getting rid of him before the non-tender deadline. The Cardinals are on the hook for that. If nobody else will be. Um, the Cardinals may have to pay some of the contract down for this year just to get maybe a better reliever in return. But I think they're trading him for a pitcher. Like that's what they're looking to do. And ultimately the fact that Mozilla came out and said, we're shopping this guy, you know, he's, he's, we're listening to offers on him is what he said, but they're shopping him. They're trying to find a, a home for him. I think what that tells you is that it doesn't really matter what the return is for the Cardinals. It's just, it's just a, a space clearing move that's going to end up happening as it pertains to Tyler O'Neill, because if you can name your starting outfield, you can name your fourth outfielder and the guy who's had over 1600 plate appearances over the past five seasons for your team is not among those names. It's pretty clear that he's not in the plant for the Cardinals moving forward. I kind of have, have hinted at that all off season. We got confirmation today. It's not a done deal, but I would be very surprised to see Tyler O'Neill on this team in February, just based on not only reading the tea leaves coming into this, but hearing from, John Mosellock today. One other thing I want to note here uh, in this episode, which is going to be shorter. I'm not going to talk for an hour straight without getting a drink of water or doing anything like that. Um, normally I can pause as I record. This time I won't be able to necessarily. Um, so I'm not going to go an hour for this one, but I do want to talk about something that I thought was interesting from Mosellock when uh, he spoke in the suite tonight. Basically, I feel like for the first time being pretty candid and admitting that, that the way in which the Cardinals kind of flubbed the Wilson Contreras situation, the transition from Yachty to Wilson and the fact that that involved the Cardinals basically hanging Wilson Contreras publicly out to dry uh, because the pitchers and him were not on the same page with what needed to be happening early in his Cardinals tenure. Uh, it only took a number of weeks before they very publicly benched him and said he's going to be a DH for a little while. They didn't really have to do it that way. Mose like saying today, you know, obviously – retrospect we wish we would have kept that a little more in house and found a way to not have that be such a public uh, saga the way that it was but I also think it was interesting that he said they were naive almost to think that transitioning from Yachty who has for the better part of two decades been handling everything when it came to catching in the St. Louis Cardinals organization and what that looked like and the relationship with pitchers and game calling and everything that went into that Mo basically said the Cardinals were naive in not understanding the full ramifications of everything that Yachty did. And it just kind of happened like clockwork for them. And they didn't have to be as hands-on in planning some of that stuff, which is, by the way, what tells you the value of what Yachty would and will bring as a member of the organization again in a coaching capacity or an advisor capacity. Mo saying tonight again, which we already knew this from Yachty's end, as it was reported earlier this week, he will not be a full-time member of the coaching staff this year. but they're going to work out a job description for him. It just hasn't happened. It doesn't sound like they've spoken yet, but Mo saying he was hopeful to talk with Yachty's agent this week here in Nashville to be able to get a better handle on what Yachty's looking for. And I think that's going to probably dictate the extent of his role. The Cardinals are going to be happy to have him in whatever capacity. Um, but I think it's going to be more like uh, come to spring training, be pretty hands-on there be able to pop into the minor league facilities during the year as he wants to. And, and, and even in St. Louis as is necessary or as is, as he wants to really, it's about what Yachty wants. That's going to dictate, I think the tone of whatever role is taken on for him there. Um, but I thought it was interesting that Mo said, yeah, you know, we were naive to think that all these things just sort of happened. And it, it kind of feeds into the theory or not even a theory, but what the, the talking points that we had 
after all of this took place back in April or May or whenever that happened with Contreras, with the Cardinals benching him, just the idea that like they didn't really know everything that Yachty did. They knew he was important. They didn't know the extent to it. And until he was gone, you really can't know. That's why I, I it is bad. It's nice to hear Mosaic admit it. I think fans will be glad to hear, like, okay, he's aware of the misstep. Fans will say, you should have known. Like, you should have been able to have a better handle on knowing the extent of what Yadi did and and not just saying, we'll be able to just bring in another catcher and everything will just happen the way that it's supposed to. I also think, though, that there was an element that not entirely possible for the Cardinals to know until you are forced to operate without him. Um, it, you know, fair or under, unfair, I think that I, I give a little bit of grace to the front office because of that. Not not a lot, but they should have been a lot more understanding. If you're to talk for years about how important Yachty is and then he's to go, don't have that just be lip service. Be very diligent in the ways that you want to make sure things run smoothly after he's gone. And I don't think they were diligent enough at the beginning, but it was nice. I think the fans would at least appreciate hearing Mosellac say as much tonight. And I'll get the actual quote for you guys. Um, it, it'll be in stories. I know it was Katie's question that was asked that I told her after. I was like, that was the best answer that we've gotten from Mo on this type of topic. And and she seemed to be pretty thrilled with the answer as well. So I, I think it's one of those things where now that the season is in the rear view mirror and you can kind of reflect upon it, Mo is a little more comfortable to say, yeah, you know, we probably could have done that a little bit differently. Um, but I, it's an interesting one to me because maybe it colors the expectations of what the Cardinals are going to look for from Contreras this year, where the kind of the safety blanket of, well, the pitchers really wanted to throw to Andrew Kisner instead. That's gone. It's almost like they took away the toy. Um, but I also think it's a largely different rotation where guys like Jack Flaherty and maybe Jordan Montgomery, who weren't, you know, so thrilled with the way that things were going early on, because I think that, you know, especially in the case of, of Jack, who had been with the Cardinals his whole career, with Montgomery, who uh, had, had been traded for the previous July, there was a level of expectations of like what they wanted it to look like. And is it like the pitchers were being just kind of malcontents because they weren't pitching well and so they were looking for somebody to blame? I think that all kind of fed into itself a little bit. And now a number of those pitchers are gone, which is not to say that Montgomery was a net negative on the Cardinals last year. Certainly not. Um, I need a haircut. He, he was a, a benefit to the team. He's our best pitcher. Jack Flaherty, you know, I think there's an element of, okay, you know, now that now that Jack is is out of the picture, there are some things that the Cardinals don't have to maybe worry about from that perspective. Because, like, the reason I'm thinking on, on these timelines and along these lines, and I don't want to, like, bash Jack Flaherty. That's not what I'm meaning to do. But Mo has talked a lot about adding, adding this veteran presence to the rotation, the new group that they have. Lance Lynn, Kyle Gibson, Sonny Gray like the veteran presence is being trumped up. But I think it's important to note that like the veterans they signed are not replacing a bunch of spring chickens in the rotation, this youthful exuberance where these young guys just didn't know what they were doing. The guys that are being replaced directly, like you can make the direct comp if you take a snapshot of the rotation in July and a snapshot of it now, the direct comparisons are take away Montgomery, Flaherty, and Wainwright, and replace them with Lynn Gibson and Gray. You know, put those guys in whatever order you want, but those are the three starters that they don't have now that they've filled the gaps with. Michaelis and Mats are coming back. Like, those are the five. So, yes, you have, like, some younger guys like Libertor and Zach Thompson that they won't be as reliant upon because they did backfill and, and add some better in-depth to the rotation. But Zach Thompson wasn't in the rotation to begin last year. Libertor was not in the rotation to begin last year. Like these guys were the the guys that you backfilled with because you traded away your starters and you had injuries. The rotation from day one is the one that you need to be better than. You don't need to be better than the rotation in the bullpen that saw Casey Lawrence and Andrew Suarez filling a bunch of innings in September. For the Cardinals to get better, they have to not have the April they had last year. And the April they had last year was with a lot of those, you know, veteran guys that are, I think are kind of being misassigned as, well, we had all this young, these young guys that they weren't quite ready for the big time. No, like you had Jack Flaherty, Jordan Montgomery, and Adam Wainwright. Wainwright was, you know, beyond his prime and was hurt all year, so that's why he struggled. 
But the other two guys were veterans. You know, Miles Michaelis was here and still is. You had veterans. I, I think it's like to to cast it aside on like these veterans that are coming in know what they're doing. And so it's going to be easier to kind of connect with Wilson Contreras because they know what they want. They've pitched for a while. And so whether it's pitch calling or game calling or whatever the case might be, they'll have more agency in that than those, you know, those young guys that we had last year. Cardinals didn't have young guys to be totally clear. Like I think it's a little bit overstated the amount that youth was relied upon in terms of the, like the starting rotation as it was designed. Right. You can, you can definitely look at Zach Thompson and the innings he pitched in Libertor and Drew Rahm in the innings those guys pitched, but those were in Dakota Hudson. Those were largely after the white flag was waved on the season for the most part. Like Thompson was a part of the bullpen mix at the beginning of the year. But if you're talking about the Contreras stuff, it wasn't those young pitchers and then Contreras just having to call games for them. And they didn't have an idea of who they were as pitchers. It's Jack Flaherty and Jordan Montgomery and Adam Wainwright that we're largely talking about here. So I think that's kind of interesting. That's not something that I've heard broken down by by people or like fans talking about it a ton. So I'm curious what you guys think of it here on YouTube. Make sure to leave some replies and, and comments in the comments section down there. Let me know what you think of all of this. Like it can work. The newfound rotation and the guys they've added, it can work for sure. But I just think it's a mischaracterization to say, Wilson Contreras didn't, you know, whether he he didn't meet the standard of what they wanted from the catcher position because he was working with these young pitchers that didn't really know themselves. And that's why there was just some miscommunication. I feel like the pitchers knew themselves and they, they still weren't on the same page with Wilson at the beginning of the year. Um, but just to say, Hey, we brought in a bunch of veterans. That's going to fix the problem. You replace veterans in your rotation. The young guys are still here. Zach Thompson, Libertor, Rom, um, you know, no Woodford, no Hudson, but those guys were practically veteran by that point. Anyway, they were both are eligible. They had been around the block. I just think it's an interesting characteriz uh, characterization. I'm not sure if fans will see it the same way as I do, uh, but it's definitely something I've been kind of thinking about today. As uh, as Moselec said, like Contreras, they were pleased with his work toward the end of the season. I think it was just largely a, hey, this is all new to everybody, and we just didn't, you know, guys going to the WBC, there just wasn't. It was It was kind of like me taking a sophomore high school Algebra 2 test where I'm like, I've been at these classes. I know we're talking about math here, but then the, the test is in front of you and you're like, I'm just kind of making it up as I go because I didn't realize that I probably should have like studied or done homework throughout the last month before this exam. That's kind of what I would liken it to with the way that the integration for Contreras and like the passing of the torch from Yachty had a bumpy start. But I don't think we need to characterize. I, uh, I can't speak. Characterize. I'll get there. Characterize. I'm tired. Characterize. I kept I kept trying to say characterize eyes in three different times. I failed. But it's not being edited out because I can't. If this is getting on YouTube tonight, it's got to be this way. I haven't even eaten dinner yet. It's 8.30. Characterize the transition from Contreras and that he's like this oaf who can't catch. I don't think that's the case. I think they just weren't quite all on the same page. The World Baseball Classic, having half the pitchers gone at that, hurt that ability to kind of get on the same page more quickly. But by the end of the year, Moselak said that they were confident and they liked what Contreras was doing. And I don't think he's just blowing smoke because if they didn't feel that way, I don't think you non-tender Andrew Kisner. I think you have that extra coverage if you weren't sure about Wilson going into the new year. I think they are. I think having Yachty down at spring training, will, which is a, a very likely thing to happen, I think that's going to be helpful as well to just – you know, Yadi or Molina can say, Wilson, you, you know, you do your thing. But if I'm a, if I'm a coach now, here's how I did spring training. Here's how you need to do it. Like give him the blueprint of how to, how to run things as the, the catcher. It's not to say that Wilson is not his own independent person. and can, and, and a talented and, and smart player. He could do a lot of these things, but it doesn't hurt to be nudged in the right direction. So that's kind of how I view the potential Yadi involvement with this team. Um, I've talked stream of consciousness. I talked about the outfield and Yachty. Those are the two things, the O'Neill thing and the, the notion of, of Wilson Contreras and how much Moselak is happy to talk about the veteran pitchers that they've added. It's correct. And I think the, the subtext of it is they added better veterans, more reliable ones than Jack Flaherty and the 42 year old version of Adam Wainwright. And so maybe I'm reading too much into it. 
he's saying the same thing I'm saying, but just not bashing anybody by name as he goes through it. Because everybody knows, like, Wainwright was at his career worst last year, and Jack Flaherty, again, fell short of expectations. Um, Montgomery, I don't think there were really any problems, but it was just one of those things where clearly to me, him and Wilson were not on the same page from, like, the beginning because it was multiple months before he caught him again. Like you could go back to the game logs and all he continued to say, yeah, we like Kisner's bat in there against the lefty. There's a lefty on the other side. So that's why Monty's being caught by Kisner for the ninth time in a row or trace Barrera or whatever. But I think there was more to it than that. It's not that big of a deal, but um, I, I just think it's interesting that yes, they've added veterans. No, it's not necessarily replacing guys who weren't also veterans in their own right. But the Cardinals had to kind of shake things up. And so I think the veterans that they brought in have the edge. Like Lance Lynn brings an edge. Sonny Gray brings an edge. It's not to say that Monty didn't. Flaherty was brought an edge of his own choosing. But I think the kind of clubhouse culture that you're going to get from a Sonny Gray, if you heard his press conference, from Lance Lynn, if you've been a Cardinal fan and kind of know what he's about, even Kyle Gibson, I think, is just a nice, steady veteran presence. So I think the rotation's got a chance to have a – just a a better vibe to it. It's not to blame any one individual that they had last year. I could talk for an hour and speculate about like the individual personalities and why it just didn't quite meld together. I also think because of the world baseball classic and the stuff we talked about with getting on the right page with Wilson, um, as far as having that catcher confidence, the fact that it started the way it did, it was almost like a, a snowball rolling down the hill. It was hard to fix midstream. You maybe had some bad feelings about it, um, internally and you're trying to go out there and compete but I think it was just kind of like they felt that they were behind the eight ball because they were and then that was a, a tough thing to come back from so I think a lot of that is kind of elements that you could characterize as to why the Cardinals season really went off the rails the way that it did last year but um, this is all just kind of speculative and having some fun talking about where this team could be heading because I do feel like even though on paper you might not look at the ERAs of the guys they brought in or the offense being drastically different, or, or the defense being drastically improved. There's a long way that this team could travel on vibes, and the vibes do feel better. Um, but again, it's still December 4th. There's not a lot that's happened yet. I think there is more that could still be to come. The bullpen is going to be the primary area the Cardinals are going to want to work, I think, throughout the rest of this week and month. Um, I'm thinking you're going to see one of the foreign relievers sign, one of these guys from Japan or Korea, um, guys like Yuki. Matsui or the uh, the other reliever Go, I believe is the, the guy's name, who is uh, being posted. I, I think the Cardinals are going to get one of those guys. I was talking to Jeff Jones about this today. Like It just feels like the foreign relief market is one the Cardinals could tap into. Not that other teams aren't aware that there's talent to be had from overseas, but it just feels like a market the Cardinals have been comfortable diving into before. You could look at Sung Wan Oh, Hwan Young Kim, Miles Michaelis counts as that, um, and and as well with Drew Verhagen, even though that one didn't maybe pan out super well. I feel like that's a route the Cardinals are going to look to go. But bullpen's going to be interesting, too. I think that'll be another podcast that we we do take a deep dive on once it starts to materialize a little bit more. But guys like Jojo Romero coming back, Ryan Helsley coming back, Gio Gallegos coming back, Moselak said they would like to add a back-end reliever to go into that 7-8-9 mix in those innings. Not that they're looking for a closer, but somebody that can be relied upon in those leverage situations, I certainly think is is something they'll be looking for. So we'll see what ends up happening there. Maybe they're able to trade for that guy. Um, You know, like the trade value of Tyler O'Neill is interesting to me. I think the Cardinals are going to move on from him regardless of what they get back. But it is interesting to wonder, like, do they, what do they think they can get for one year of Tyler O'Neill that's going to be owed five, six million dollars to play. I, I'm not sure what level of relief pitcher they're going to get for him. Um, but ideally he's somebody that can mix in and and even if he's not a proven leverage arm, somebody that could work his way into that role for the Cardinals. I think that's kind of what they'll be looking to do. But I've talked for long enough. I gotta go grab some food. Hope you guys have enjoyed this video, different as it may be. Audio quality will return by Thursday um, when I have a, a chance to kind of set up my full equipment once again. But thank you guys so much for watching and listening. If you're on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, watch on YouTube. It'll make a lot more sense for this particular episode because I did the video in one uh, one fell swoop. But thank you guys so much for watching and listening as always. And we'll talk to you next time on Be Shape Daily.
Peace. And subscribe, would you?